So um, I'm going to talk about um, OLIF, when and how to utilize the OLIF. And you know, for for a conference like this, I, I always like to to put things in perspective, right? This is a picture from the Untouchables. And you know, when we talk about either OLIF, XLIF, prone, transos, lateral ALIF, you know, they're all sort of part of the same family, right? All part of the same team here, I think. And especially when we're we're here at a lateral course. And again, to, to put it in perspective, oftentimes I'll I'll discuss, well, when you have inner bodies, you can do anterior, you can do posterior, or you can do all of these things in lateral. And then all of those things in lateral are really just cousins of each other, and, and there are nuances between them. But ultimately, like uh, you know, Juan said, you, you end up in the same space. It's just the nuances of, of how you get there. So for the OLIF, you know, it, it was originally branded as an oblique lateral inner body fusion. This is the Medtronic trademark. Over time, it's also known as oblique lumbar inner body fusion, anterior to psoas approach, ATP, pre psoas approach. Ultimately, in, in reality, it, it is an oblique anterior psoas approach, right? And I, I make that distinction because initially when I was learning it and, and when it was done probably a little bit ago, you have this diagram where you measure the distance from the vessels to the psoas, right? And uh, people mistakenly thought that, that this was the corridor, right? But this is not the corridor. The corridor is through the anterior psoas. So if you take some of those fibers, that's okay, because what makes a difference is you're not going directly trans psoas and you're much further away from the lumbar plexus. And so in that way, you know, I always just take a look at where that cage is going to go, wherever that anterior cage is, that's essentially where I dock my first dilator. And so when you take a look at some of these diagrams that, that you may see from the brochures, you know, as close as you can get is pretty much the ideal, especially when you're at 4.5, you want to hug that crest as close as you can get. And so although this cone is possible, right, depending on where you're going, this is still going to get you the best trajectory for your approach even if you're not directly trans psoas uh, orthogonally anymore. And again, you take a look at something like this in the brochure, I'm like, I don't want to do an open surgery like this. But OLIF surgery is still very small, right? So although the initial descriptions, you can put in like a renal vein retractor and, and open everything up, these are getting smaller. And in a modern sense, this is still a, a minimally invasive surgery. Now, you know, the title of this talk is, is when and how to utilize the OLIF. So when and how. But I do want to spend a few slides on why, right? And so for my few slides on why, the, the reasons why I do OLIF are, one, you get consistent and dependable access to L4-5, right? Essentially every level, like Neil said, and pretty much everyone says, we don't really look at the crest anymore. And for an OLIF, I, I never look at the crest because I'm always in front of it, right? And so in that way, it doesn't matter. The second reason, it's the single position ability to do a 5-1 lateral ALIF. So I still am in lateral decubitus because if I have to do 5-1, I can put in a lateral ALIF cage. And we know that ALIF cages are, are the king of inner bodies. And so that, that's certainly a preference. And then as I showed in my prior case, this also allows me to do one-to-one -one in a single stage. So if I'm doing multiple inner bodies, I'm not doing an ALIF and then doing lateral and then doing prone. It's all in lateral position. And so for these reasons, the OLIF, although if you look at it as a single inner body, you can do lots of different options. This is a, an avenue to do things like four or five at every level, single position at five one, and then MIS deformity from one to one. And so that means that, you know, although we've been talking about single levels at four or five, that also means that I can do a three to one where I'm doing, you know, inner bodies at three, four, four, five, and a lateral A lift at five one. And then naturally the case I showed earlier where I'm doing one to one. And so this is why I stay in lateral decubitus with the OLIF as, as the main workhorse of much of what I do. Now, when to do the OLIF, and this was actually touched upon um, pretty briefly, but it's all about patient selection. L1 to 4, you can do you know, any time, right? Any, any lateral position you want, that's totally fine. But at 4 5, you do want to confirm the vessel anatomy on MRI. And really, what this involves is identifying those great vessels and that vessel to psoas distance. So here's an example, right? You have vein, artery, artery, and then here's that vessel to psoas distance. And the thing is, at the OLIF approach, it's still through an oblique anterior psoas fiber corridor, but the reasons why you have that distance is you want to give yourself some room for error in case it's your first time or um, you know, you're just unsure of where you are. 
right? Same thing here, you have vein, artery, that anterior uh, distance between the vessel and the psoas, right? This is the trajectory, very safe corridor. Another example, right, you have vein, artery, artery, and then this is, you know, essentially where I would put that first pin on the retractor. Where you start to get, you know, into uh, potential issues is say something like this. Now you have your vein, your artery, uh, you start to have that bifurcation, and say this is your trajectory for the oblique approach, but what if you're a little bit off, right? And so this is, this is where you start to get into an area where if this is your first few cases, you may not necessarily want to do it. I, I still did this case. The artery is a thick-walled vessel. You put your finger in there, you feel it, you put your attractor behind that, but still something to consider. Again, something like this, and this is what um, Neil had referred to. You have the two veins, you have the artery. This is technically your corridor, but what if you're off and now the vein is behind the artery, right? So here, even if you feel the artery, if you injure that vein, it would be a very, very uh, bad day for you in that particular case. And then the last example here, again, you have the vein at the bifurcation, you have the artery, right? Here's your approach, but if you're a little bit off, then, then this is what you see. Now again, I did this case uh, still, and this is what it looks like, right? So when you're coming down on a vessel, I shallow dock, and then I open. And again, by this time, I'd been doing OLIS for like probably a year or two already, so I was comfortable. But in this way, this is what the vein looks like. But the disc is right behind the psoas there. So the vein is seen, it's protected. I push that psoas back, you can see the disc space, and then you do your discectomy. So all of this is still possible, but you know, naturally, you sort of have to be all in on Olaf to be comfortable in doing this. And for me, I just, I dislike doing T lifts enough where I would rather do this because this is the cage that I get, right? So I'm, I'm not as talented as Dr. Chapman, but through a lateral approach, this is the cage I was able to do um, while still protecting that vessel anatomy as long as you're aware of what you're looking at. So again, ultimately, for patient selection, it's all about the vessel anatomy. Again, L1 to 4, you can do it any time. The vessels are, are so far away. But at 4 or 5, especially if you're starting out, just give yourself some room. And this is the corridor, essentially, for, for what an OLIF approach would be, as opposed to, say, something more direct uh, through a uh, direct transos approach. So how do you do this? Um, again, you know, it, it's always nice to talk through, uh, talk through a case. So here's a 61-year-old female coming in, back pain, right leg pain. She can only stand for uh, a few minutes before she has her symptoms, failed conservative man, uh, measures, neuro intact. And you can see here, uh, you know, the 4-5 the spondy. For the people who go direct, right, here's the crest. Uh, but again, I, I don't look at the crest anymore um, unless there's a transitional anatomy where that's buried deep far down. Here's her MRI. And naturally, you can see here the top-down stenosis on her right side. So for her, 61-year-old coming in with the degen spondy, and my plan, again, uh, single position, 4-5 OLIF. And this is the positioning. So she's positioned, again, for me on a flat Jackson, back all the way to the edge of the table again. It's a robot-assisted case, so I do have navigation uh, for the procedure. And this is how I think about, in terms of that approach, right, here's the vein, here's the artery, here's the psoas, right, here's that anterior blood vessel, the psoas distance. And again, this is not where you go, right? When they used to call it anterior to psoas, people would think you go anterior to the psoas, but this doesn't make sense, right? The actual approach is essentially, I draw where I want that cage to be, and then that's where I dock my first dilator, and then everything else is pushed back posteriorly. So the tractor goes here, and then that psoas is reflected posteriorly, and you just work all underneath the psoas to get in that cage. Naturally, you always wanna look at the vein on the other side, to make sure that the vessels are, are clear. And this is what that view is like, right? So you can see here the psoas is being pushed posteriorly. You have L4, you have L5, and then you do your discectomy, right? And again, as you can see, the discectomy goes from the front corner, and then I will cut all the way back posteriorly behind that psoas as far as I need to go to have a very wide annulotomy. And, and how I do this, I mentioned this earlier, my residents always know, KCP, KCT, those are the six instruments I use. Knife, cop, pituitary, keratin, curettes, and you go straight to a trial. And again, here's that uh, thoroscopy showing the cage going uh, from an AP, and then uh, from the lateral. And once that goes in, you can see as the retractor comes out, sort of the healthy appearing psoas muscle 
uh, as it comes on out, right? So you can see the psoas was initially pushed posteriorly, and then it comes just right back out, back into position. And then, of course, you have the final uh, x-ray, small incision, you know, like all lateral surgeries are, small incision posteriorly, and then, again, good correction uh, from her spondy. So ultimately, this is the idea, right? So as opposed to coming directly orthogonal, you are slightly oblique. The analogy that everyone always uses, I use as well, think of an ACDF, right? ACDF, we do that like day in, day out. It's an oblique approach to the cervical spine. The OLIF is the same. And again, it's not anterior to the psoas per se in that space. It's not directly lateral, but you are going uh, at the anterior psoas to get to that space. So in conclusion, you know, when you do it, you want to always check the MRI for the great vessel anatomy. Uh, how you do it, uh, I aim for that anterior psoas border, right, wherever you place your cage. And then why I do it, you get all the L4-5 levels, I can do single position with a 5-1 lateral a lift, and then I can do MI deforming in that single first stage, going from top down. Ultimately, you're at a lateral course, so the benefits are you get to hear and choose on however way you want to access the lateral um, spine. There are a variety of ways to get there. You know, for me, uh, I chose the OLIF, for the reasons that I mentioned. And you really just gotta choose um, what makes the most sense for you, get very good at it, and then learn all the pros and cons. And for me, of course, that was the um, oblique anterior approach. So, thank you. All right, all right I guess we can move on to the next one. Thanks, thanks, Martin. <coughs> As most surgeons are trans, so there'll be no further questions. <laughs> <laughs> the lab. I actually wanted to ask, is, yeah, is. Is, is, is it hard to learn <coughs> that anti approach? Like in terms of, I feel like I have to be a little bit of like a vascular surgeon, a little I mean, bit of like, you know what I mean? So what, what's the question? You? I'm asking how, what's the learning curve, learning the anti approach? Because I feel like you're dealing with the vessels, you're dealing with the psoas. Uh, I'm a little bit scared to take that corridor, to be honest with you. You know, dealing I, with the aorta and all that. I mean, I think the, the direct trans psoas approach, the x lift, I think was a procedure in the spine um, that was designed very well. It's probably the most straightforward approach because when I think about it, you know, when I teach, say, um, ACDF, right, to residents, it's so many steps. You come on down the neck, watch out for the esophagus, watch out for the carotid, you know, you get down the longus, watch out for the sympathetic chain, don't bovie in it. And then you think about the X-lift and they, you know, you've really narrowed it down to about six steps and it's, it's done very well. I don't think anything can ever compare to the simplicity and beauty of, of the direct transose approach. That being said, if you think about the initial way on how you learned how to do an ACDF, that's exactly what the OLIF is. There are certain things that are just slightly different um, and really, it's just okay, at four or five, right? If, if you're doing anything higher up, it's the same. I just stand in front of the patient. Up at four or five, even, though, even if I dock at the anterior 25%, I look directly down, and all my instruments are straight up and down. So the learning curve is really just if you're doing four or five, um, but it's not difficult, you know? It's, uh, it, it can never be as simple, I think, as a direct transoas, but you probably add, instead of six steps, it's maybe eight or nine. You're just thinking of slightly different things. And you're just still making sure you're going ceiling to floor, but the the learning curve is not hard. And, you know, all, all of my residents know how to approach. I think the analogy to HDF. Yeah. Are you breaking the contralateral annulus with all of your instruments? Correct. So these instruments are 20 and 25 degree angled. So I'll use angled instruments at four or five because I'm in front of the crust. So that is as the instrument goes in, it's essentially this shape. It comes on down and there's a 20 to 25 degree angle and I will break the contralateral annulus just like in the direct transos approach. I mean, yeah. You got a great correction there. Um, yeah. And again, so the, the principles, I mean, to that point, <coughs> the, the principles are still the same. You show this, no one would be able to tell if this was a direct lateral decubitus, OLIF, or PTP. And that's sort of the idea. And the principles of opening up the contralateral annulus, getting good coverage, um, you know, and getting the correction are all 100% the same. It's just on, um, you know, how you get there and, and the number of people you can get there, say at four or five. I, I've never used sort of those up and down angled instruments for the iliac crust, right? Because I'm, I'm always in front. Um, so it's really, I use angled tools for the front, 
if you're doing direct transpose, then you may be using sort of the up and down angles to do the same thing. But you're basically anterior docking. So I wonder if it's more the cage placement or the positioning. Yeah. You know, cage placement we know is really important. Yeah. So yeah. that's what you want to put in. Yeah. yeah. Yes? If you're doing a long construct on that level, what do you position the patient in on the operative table in the lateral position? My anterior or posterior in the middle? Yes. I mean, so for, for the positioning, um, if I'm doing a single position, then I will put them all the way to the back of yeah, the bed. So that means when I'm standing, I mean, technically they are slightly further well, away from me, is, is um, but I haven't found it too much of an issue, no, I think. Talk. I don't know. I cancel my lab. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Correct. Yeah, and so in, in this particular case, the, the patient is positioned all the way to the back. Now, I will say, um, you know, this isn't necessarily a, a single position lateral talk, but the screws that go in, they are always slightly straighter than prone, right? When you look at my screws, they're probably maybe 18, 15 to 18 degrees, right, at max versus, say, 20 degrees. And so many of those screws will just look straighter um, due to the limitations of this. And the, the real thing there is just because they're coming in straighter, you just want to avoid the facet joint at the UIV because it's, it's much easier to accidentally hit it or grab it. But um, other than that, that's, that's how I mitigate that. I have tried to you know, just get in that steepest angle, say 20, 25 degree, and it just really is difficult. And I think about, am I really getting a lot of benefit as long as I avoid that um, cranial joint? You did that T10 to pelvis single position? No, no. Oh, thank God. Thank no, no. The, the single position was just the three to one. The, oh, this was just showing an example of why, right. naturally, why I do that. <laughs> All right. So, so, how many centimeters from the line do you make your lateral decisions uh, for, for the screws? For the back? Uh, so, it, since I do it robot assisted, I just go where the robot goes at that point. Yeah. I think historically, you know, the, the teaching at least prone is about four centimeters off midline, right? Because that's where you know, the joints are will be. Um, the times where I've done it navigated, like we do have a, a trauma hospital that just has navigation and not robotics. In that case, I'll still just use the navigation and I'll, I'll just figure out where it's the most um, intuitive. Yeah. Well, I'm already answering your question. I totally stop. You, you, when you use the robot, which I do for a single position, yeah. your insistence all over the damn place. So I'd much rather mark it, I'll make my incision yeah. and then use a the robot to go down. So it's a clean, beautiful incision. Oh, it's all over. One year's one there, one there. It looks like so much of the whole up. Yeah. So I've and totally changed from the, the change. Yeah, for that, I'll, I'll typically mark, you know, say the cranial and caudal screws. Yeah. Mark it. And then I'll split the difference, right? Because it all fits in through the same incision. Sometimes I'll pair them um, if it's like, say, a two to one or something like that. But. Because yeah. I usually mark 